Hello, in this video, we're going to learn how to solve problems using the idea of centripetal force. So when an object is moving in circular motion, we're going to learn to use that uh, net force equals mv squared over r. So here we go. Okay, one of the simplest examples is you swing something around on a string. So uh, this is an experiment we have done in class. Uh, it is an experiment that you can do at home if you have a, a, a string. Uh, I don't know, a yo-yo, even a set of keys, something on the end of a string. Uh, you know, um, be, put on some safety goggles and be careful, but you can grab a thing on a string and swing it around your head like a sling. And there you go, you got something swinging around your head in a horizontal circle. I say to you, the only force acting on that thing is a force towards the center, because I bet you, uh, I take no responsibility for any damage to your screen or devices in the room, but if you were to swing something around your head and let it go, it would go flying off in a straight line. The only force acting is the force keeping it in a circle. So if you're swinging this thing around your head, uh, we're looking down from a bird's eye view and it's swinging this way, if you were to let go of the string at this moment, it would go flying off in a straight line but the string is attached and it's pulling in towards the center of the circle, which instead of this thing going flying straight off, it gets turned now and it continues to turn in a circle. So that force is inward, it's towards the center and that would be a force from a string. So it would be tension. We said this in the last video, but what we care about is this direction. We can call it a circular direction. It's almost its own dimension, if you want to think of it that way. Because all I really care about are forces that are acting towards the center of the circle or away from the center of the circle. So when you're doing the free body diagrams here, you can essentially draw a diameter through the circle that passes through the object moving in circular motion. And then we draw any forces along that diameter, in or out. And that's how we're going to set these up. So here's my free body diagram. There is... Um, you know, a force of gravity, but it would be pointing like straight down into the page. And there's probably some vertical component of the tension here that's keeping it suspended in the air that's pointing up at us out of the screen. But since it's not along this diameter, we don't really care about it. So there's an amount of tension pulling inwards here. And that's the only force in this direction. So that is the sum of all the forces. Very much like FBD problems where I just have one force accelerating an object, the net force is just that force. We're going to say towards the center is positive, so I'm again going to get in the habit of putting a plus in front of all of my forces, even though I don't math need it, it reminds me that direction is important. So I have a force of tension towards the center of the circle, and just like when I do F equals MA, I sum all my forces and I set that equal to mass times acceleration. Same thing here. The sum of all the forces is just tension. And I set it equal to M times acceleration, which is V squared over R. Um, so this shows a few things. You know, if, if I increase the speed, if you spin that thing around your head faster and faster, you will certainly feel that that tension increases. And then if you decrease the radius, you would also feel that that tension increases. So you can see the force of tension depends on these things. Um, in a very dramatic sense, if you swung it fast enough, you could hit such a speed that the, uh, you would create such a great force of tension that the string would break. All right, but that would be the whole setup for this. And of course, depending on what you might need in a problem, you could plug in, but we're just looking at the net force equations and how all these variables relate in these different contexts. All right, so that's how I would set up the net force for a simple thing moving in a circle only because of tension. Let's look at something more exciting. This is a classic example of circular motion, which doesn't maybe look like circular motion at the beginning, but a dip in the road when you're driving your car and there's a, there's a hill and you come down to a dip and you drive down and drive up. This counts as circular motion because in this leg, in, within the dip, your car is moving in a circular way. The car doesn't literally need to go up and complete a whole 360 degree circle for it to be circular motion. If you really like, it's moving through a circular arc. And we could even, I suppose, approximate the road as a circular arc here. 
and the car is then moving in part of a circle. If that's true, there must be a centripetal force. There must be some net force towards the center of the circle. So here's how we would draw a free body diagram in this case. We'd, we're looking right down at the very bottom of the dip. Um, so I care about forces this way. The diameter of this circle would be like here. I care about forces towards the center of that circle or away from it. Okay, the circle is, is uh, essentially imaginary here. We're imagining the curvature of the road continuing to form a circle. And we're going to define R. This is sometimes called the radius of curvature. So this defines how curvy this section of road is. The idea is if you took that section of road and completed a circle with it, what would the radius of that circle be? That's the radius of curvature. Or the radius of that circular arc, if you like. Okay, so the car is moving to the left. That's its tangential velocity. But we just care about the forces. And there's two of them. There's, a, there's the weight of the car, of course, because force of gravity will always pull down the weight of the object. M times little g, mass times acceleration due to gravity. Remember, we will never simply call this gravity. That would be very sloppy. It's the force due to gravity, the weight of the object, something like that. And there's also a normal force or a normal reaction force. The IB will sometimes use R or F sub N. Either way, there's a force pushing up on the wheels of the car from the ground, which is the ground reacting to the car, not letting it pass through. Remember, that's always perpendicular to the surface. Since we're flat right here, it's going to be upwards. Okay, so the rule would be that we sum all our forces in this direction then. And we say towards the center of the circle is positive and away from the center of the circle is negative. Normal force is pointing towards the center of the circle, so we're going to call that positive. The force of gravity is pointing away, we're going to call that negative. Notice we're using FG and W interchangeably here. They are synonyms, but never just G. So that's the sum of my forces. Now I can set the sum of my forces equal to mv squared over r. The normal force minus the force of gravity, we're substituting in our formula for weight now, which of course you have memorized. M times acceleration due to gravity gives me the force due to gravity on the surface of the Earth. And it's equal to mv squared over r. All right, so there we go. Now what's interesting here is we can see if we care to solve for it, just to look at something fun. The normal force is not equal to the weight of the object. Remember, that is not a rule. That's never assume that. And it can't be true here. If you're moving in a circle, a split second later, the car is going to be higher than it was before. That normal force has to be bigger than the weight in order for the car to make it through the loop or else it would just smash in through the road. The normal force is pushing up on the car more than the force of gravity. The earth is pulling down on the car in this moment to make it move in a circle. And again, we can see, in fact, the faster you go, the bigger that normal force is, and the tighter the dip, the bigger that normal force is. You've probably noticed both these things. The normal force, we can also think of if you're talking about you, the normal force on you is your apparent weight. Remember, that's what we call the normal force sometimes. That's what you feel like your weight is. Right? If you're in free fall, you're on the Tower of Terror, the, the elevator drops out from under you, you feel weightless for a second because the chair is no longer pushing up on you. Or you still have the same weight, m times g, but the normal force is what you really feel and think of as your weight. When you drive your car through a dip in the road, especially if you're going at some noticeable speed, you feel that, right? You feel the, the chair push up on you and you feel heavier for a second. You almost feel like you sink into the seat. You feel the seat pushing up on you. That's the normal force getting bigger to make you move in a circle. You can do the opposite problem and we will do it. If you go over a hill, then what you see is up at the top of the hill, you have sort of the opposite situation. You need to move you know, down in the circle so the weight will be bigger than the normal force. In other words, your normal force is less than your weight and you can feel kind of weightless when you go over a hill. Hopefully not too quickly, but you will feel that weightlessness because the normal force is less than the weight. So that shows you how they relate in circular motion. Normal force is not equal to the weight. Remember, 
that's not a thing. Another example you will see quite a bit is orbital motion. Orbital motion is circular motion. Most planets orbit the sun in a nearly circular path. The moon orbits the sun, uh, oh, sorry, the moon orbits the earth in an almost perfectly circular path. It's amazing how close to a perfect circle it really is. So there's the radius of the path and we could use these ideas now to find the orbital speed of the moon. So here's how we would do that. Again, we need to think about the moon and the earth and any forces acting between them causing the moon to move in a circle. So I look at my diameter and I think what forces act on the moon either way. Well, there's only one, it's the force of gravity. The earth pulls on the moon because they both got mass. The earth pulls the moon towards it which keeps it from flying off into space. So again, this net force is only one. This is the only force between the Earth and the Moon. Of course, the Moon has its own force of gravity on the Earth, but I'm just looking at the Moon. And the only force on the Moon is the force of gravity from the Earth. That's my centripetal force. So the force of gravity is mv squared over r. Now we can look at the orbital speed. What I need is I need to think about the force due to gravity between the Earth and the Moon. And now I need to go, because I'm looking out in space at two objects some distance apart, both with mass, I need to go to my trusty data booklet and to good old lug, the law of universal gravitation. The force due to gravity between two objects with masses is their mass is multiplied together divided by the distance between them squared times Newton's gravitational constant, big G. That's a good one. Remember, if you're not on the surface of the Earth, you want to use lug to find the force due to gravity between two objects. Uh, we're going to use ME and MM for mass of the Earth and mass of the moon so that we can be careful. And remember, when we're doing like MA, this is the mass of the thing that's accelerating, which for us is the moon. That's the mass of the moon, so good news is mass of the moon cancels out. One of these R's cancels out, and if I do some algebra, I'm gonna find that V squared is this whole term, so we can solve for V. Uh, square root of big G times the mass of the thing that I'm orbiting, here the Earth, divided by R, the distance between them, square rooted. If you look in your data booklet, you will see this equation is the orbital speed equation. Amazing. Um, which I believe is in topic 10, but we can derive it just with the circular motion. The circular motion will tell you about the orbital speed of an object. This works for anything where you have one object orbiting the another because of gravity. All right, now if we look up, we would need to look up the mass of the Earth here to get this value. But if you put the mass of the Earth in here, the radius, be careful, kilometers, meters, you should find that the moon is going about a thousand meters a second in tangential speed, very fast. All right, so the moon is moving really fast, but the only force acting on it is the force of gravity because it's in free fall. So just for fun to revisit this idea, we can look at a simulation here of what it really means to orbit and what it really means that there's a force of gravity acting while something is in orbit. So here's a simulation called Newton's Cannon. The idea is we can see, uh, well, it's a thought experiment, and I put a cannon on top of a mountain and we fire a cannonball, why not? <laughs> All right, uh, the cannonball goes a little way and falls because gravity's acting, of course it does. But the thought experiment goes like this, what if I fire it faster? Ooh, hit the ocean. It goes further. It goes further and falls. Ah, but what if I go even faster? And it goes even further and falls. The whole time it's falling. The whole time the force of gravity is acting, pulling it towards the center of the Earth. But you get where I'm going. There is a speed at which it's falling, it's falling, it's falling, it's falling towards the planet. It's falling, it's plummeting towards the surface of the Earth. It's falling, it's falling, it's falling. The whole time here, it's falling. Uh, and it gets right back to where it started because it's going so fast side to side that it doesn't have time to hit the surface. That's what orbit is. You're falling, but you're just moving to the side so fast that the planet curves away from you. 
That's all Orbit is. One other kind of silly version of this that gets the same point across is uh, seen the Olympics with these super long jumps on skis. That's the same idea. All right, this skier is going so fast, falling the whole time, but the the slope of the slope here is um, you know, is 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 falling away as quickly as he is falling down. And so it looks like he's almost flying, even though he's just falling at the same rate as the ground is like sloping away from him. Orbit is the same thing, just way faster. You're going so fast that the actual curvature of the planet curves away from you. All right, so remember, orbit is, is, is just falling. The force due to gravity is acting the whole time. And that's why you feel weightless, because there's no normal force. The skier weighs just as much as he did when he went off the ramp, but certainly feels like he weighs nothing at all in the air. All right, so those are some of the common examples. We will have one more video where we look at some more interesting uh, examples of circular motion in action, but hopefully you're getting the picture now. Draw an FBD, sum the forces, set them equal to mv squared over r. You go from there. We'll pick it up next time.